Good morning, Shinobi. How is the hangover? Uh, it's, it's, it's a decent one today. You know, it's noticeable, but not quite incapacitating. I mean, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Perhaps we will... Perhaps we'll build a hangover together in... Uh... Can we talk about you being in Miami? Didn't oh, think yeah. about that. Yeah, you're going to be in Miami, secretly hiding with your with your secret disguise. But I'm going to find you. We're going to have a beer. We're going to have many beers. We have many beers, many beers. Well, not as many as you normally have because I've got to work. You are just there holidaying it and sunning yourself. I've actually got to work. <laughs> anyway, listen. It's been a wild week. People are going to expect me to ask you about some of this stuff, but. I, I really want to focus on today's That's show. That's it. I quit, Peter. I refuse to do this. <laughs> no, I want, to, I want to focus on today's show because, uh, as you rightly said, the stuff we're talking about is uh, today is consensus changes. It's like a very important subject for people who are wanting to understand about Bitcoin tech. Uh, and we will cover some of the stuff, uh, uh, the other stuff, towards the end of the show because uh, there is some historical... Uh, stuff that I just want you to run through because you'll do a better job than me. I mean, I, I just want it for me, but we'll cover it then, that at the end. But we're doing consensus changes today. This was your choice. This is your decision. Uh, and I think it's a good natural progression from the other shows we've been doing, which, as you know, have been very popular. Um, but why do you think, well, why was it important for you to c- cover consensus changes? I've got three questions. What are consensus changes? And does everybody, like, do all Bitcoiners really need to know this? Obviously, um, a big part of the reason why is the thing we can't talk about until the end of the show going on right now. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I just thought, you know, given the fact that we are currently activating a new feature, this would be a really important thing to get into. And then, two, um, really, it's it's just adding rules. I mean, and traditionally, there are two ways we'll, we'll get deep into the meat of this later in the show um, to kind of change the rules. You can either expand them and allow something that was not allowed before, which would be a hard fork, or you can restrict them and kind of stop allowing something that was allowed before. And that's a soft fork. So you can kind of go in two different directions and kind of make the rules more restrictive or less restrictive. But the the general idea with rules is, you know, like um, <clears throat> I can lock my coins so that only my key will will move them. Well, let's say, I don't know, we want some new feature that will let you spend those coins as long as you put any even number in the transaction. Um, you know, I, I don't know why on earth we'd want to do something silly like that. Everyone's coins would get stolen if they used it. But we would have to go through a consensus change for that. Like we, we would have to either soft or hard fork that new rule in and get everybody running it. Otherwise, um, you know, you don't just spend that with a, an even number. Like you could just spend that with no number because no one's enforcing the rule. Well, okay. I think there's going to be some people listening who are already like, I have no idea, Shinobi, what, you, what the hell are you talking about? So I think we have to break this down super simple. Super simple, step by step. And I think the starting point to is to ex- explain what consensus rules are, why they exist in Bitcoin, and, uh, and, and uh, how they are, like how nodes enforce those rules. So maybe a starting point is, is just to do a, a node recap, what a node is and what it does. Well, the, the node is the little machine you run that is actually getting blocks in the blockchain and checking all the contents to make sure they're following rules. So <clears throat> to make sure that every signature for every transaction is valid, that nobody's stealing coins they don't have the keys to, um, you know, making sure that the proof of work on the block that comes in is actually valid against the difficulty target. All, all the little things that make sure no one's breaking the rules of the system. And the only reason um, all of this works is essentially that everybody's running rules that are compatible together on a separate machine. So the, the whole idea of the Bitcoin network is literally just a result that all these people all on their own are running a node 
enforcing these rules that is compatible with everyone else's. And that is the sole single thing that makes the Bitcoin network is just the same rules, everybody running them. And where miners come into this picture is well, let's, just let's, kind let's, of... Let's, let's stick with that for a second. Again, I'm going to, as you know, I'll always keep it super simple. Um, so for people who who might have only just gone into Bitcoin, what we're really talking about is the design of the system that allows it to be decentralized. So like everybody is enforcing these rules and checking the the blocks that come in against them 100% independently. Like there so, there's no authority well, there. You're doing it yourself. Yeah, and I'm going to just separate it because there's going to be two types of users that are listening. Those who are uh, most likely those who are listening who aren't operating a node. Um, and therefore using somebody else's without realizing it, and those that are operating a node. So those operating a node will understand a bunch of this, but there there will be people who are buying coins on exchanges or holding on a hardware wallet and not running a node, but they probably don't realize that the only way they can send and receive Bitcoin is because the exchange they're using is running a node, so that by virtue you, they're using their node, and similar with a hardware wallet. So... If they're again, if they're not running a node, they're relying on somebody else's. But the it's the network of nodes which keeps Bitcoin decentralized, mm-hmm. and most importantly, the ability for everybody to run one. Like if, if you can't actually spin that node up and run that on your own computer, then you can't partake in that network. You can't verify anything yourself. Well, well, bear with me. I mean, you can partake in it as long as you use somebody else's node. But what well, not, as a, not as a peer on the network. You know yeah, you're I mean? not a peer on the network. You're using somebody else's peer. I, th- I just want to keep to that absolute basics of trying to explain to people that it is the network and nodes, whether you are running one yourself or whether you are using a service which operates a node itself. Everybody is sending and receiving because the nodes exist. And to keep the network decentralized and functioning, they all have to be in agreement with each other. And then, you know, where where miners come into this is they're just kind of grabbing transactions people throw at them, putting them in a block and stamping that with proof of work. And, you know, they spit that out to the network. It arrives at everybody's nodes and they validate it. But the idea is, you know, if that's not a valid block, if something in that block is a incorrect transaction or broke some rule, then that miner earns no money because nobody running that node, no business, no exchange or anything will actually accept the coins that that miner mined because something is invalid in that block. So it makes that block invalid, which makes everything in that block invalid, including what the miner just earned mining. it. And that's literally these two things together. The only reason you have that cohesive Bitcoin network is everyone runs the same rules and miners follow those rules because if they don't, then they don't earn any money. That that is literally the only thing that holds the Bitcoin network together is just people doing these things in a compatible way and that just working out. So in its most basic form, tell me if I'm correct. But so people can understand is that the Bitcoin network really in, in its most basic form is the blockchain, the chain of blocks building on top of each other. It is the, is the miner that goes to create the block, as you said, pulling all the transactions in. And once a block is found, it is the nodes that accept it, validate it, and all agree that that is a valid block. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to kind of sh- real quick, like give an example of like just how this holds itself together like this, um, like Bcash, um, Bitcoin Cash is a perfect example of, you know, they changed rules. <clears throat> they they expanded the block size and made themselves not compatible with the rest of the Bitcoin network. And so that split. And all the miners who chose to go mine on that are mining on their different blockchain now that is only accepted by different nodes. And that is just entirely because they pick different rules. And so when that Bitcoin cash block first showed up to Bitcoin nodes, they went, no, like this is invalid. This is not following our rules. 
But all the people who upgraded to a Bitcoin cash node, they saw that block come in and they went, no, okay, this is a okay. Like this fits our rules perfectly. And those two things split off into their own coin because people chose like, okay, like we want different rules. Um, so we're going to run those different rules and things split in half. And that can always happen. Like under like all the different ways to upgrade consensus rules, the stuff we're going to get into in the show, every single one of them comes with the possibility <clears throat> that you have the chain split into two separate things like that. And now that doesn't always mean that it will happen persistently, like with Bitcoin Cash, like the chain will split in two and it will stay split in two forever. But no matter what you're doing to try to change consensus rules, there is always the risk that that, that chain can split in half. And I mean, the risk might be less with some ways, might be more with others, but that risk is always going to be there. Okay, so the nodes themselves hold the blockchain. That's how I understand it. That's the only place they exist. The thousands, maybe tens of thousands of nodes that, ex that exist out there all hold a copy of the blockchain. And when the miner mines a block, they create the block for the nodes, for all the nodes to add, add it to their blockchain. And the first thing the nodes do when they receive a block is they check whether it follows the rules. If it breaks any of the rules, that block will be rejected. But if it follows the rules exactly, that will be the new block that's built upon the blockchain and the miners will start mining the next block. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, great. Um, and we'll, we'll come to hard forks because there's different types. But um, if a miner, and, and this is where the game theory plays in, right? A, a miner will currently earn, what is it, about 240? Yeah, so I said about $240,000 uh, in block reward, and they will earn, then earn the mining fees on top. So for people Period. listening... It's, it's, this is Bitcoin. It's 6.25 yeah. Bitcoin. Who cares how I know, many dollars I know. it's worth? Yeah, but they pay, <laughs> they pay their electricity bills probably in dollars, not Bitcoin. But just for those understanding is that this is where the, the game theory is really important. It's very hard to mine a block because all the miners are competing. But um, if a miner makes a mistake or tries to cheat the system, that block will be rejected. Therefore, they miss out on the 6.25 Bitcoin, which is worth about $240,000 now. And they also miss out on the mining rewards, which I understand to be about 20% on top. Is that about correct? Um, the It kind of ebbs and flows. Um based on the fee market, but, you but know, just, just random, random fact, there actually has been in 2017 a time period where miners earned more in fees than they did in the Coinbase reward in 2017. Okay, okay. so we separate them, they get, a, they get the block reward, and then they get the, uh, they get the transactional fees, which is the fees you and I pay when we send each other Bitcoin. But, but anyway, so what happens is once that block is accepted, uh, it's added to the blockchain, and then 90 blocks later, as I understand it, uh, that miner receives their payout. But that this is what keeps the network honest, is that the nodes enforce the consensus rules, and the miners have to keep to those rules. And if they break it, the block isn't added, and they lose their reward. Mm -hmm. Although I do think that the um, maturation period is 144 blocks, or, or no, 100... A hundred, I think, actually, yeah. I think it's 90. If I know this and you don't, that's going to be amazing. I'm um, sticking with a hundred. I'm going to bet you uh, a night on the beers on this. Right, I'm going to double check that, but I think you might be right. Oh, okay, I, I owe you a night out temporarily. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I always thought it was 90 blocks. One zero zero, sir. How much fiat you're going to be spending on beers for me? <laughs> <laughs> How is that block broadcast to the network by the miner once they found it? And how do the nodes distribute that? What actually happens in that process? They literally just send it to every node connected to them. Like every node on the network is always connected to other nodes <clears throat> and kind of passing back like transactions people are relaying, things like that. 
Um, the second a miner finds a block, that goes from the actual hardware operator to the mining pool and its node. And then that node just spits it out to the rest of the network. And then as soon as everybody validates that the proof of work is valid and the contents are valid, they just spit that out to the next node and to the next node and to the next node. And you, usually a, a block will propagate through the whole network in a, a couple of seconds that way. Okay. So why is it that we have 10-minute block times? Well, I could be a cheeky smartass and say it has to do with the speed of light limit and the diameter of Earth and then pull out a whiteboard and start scribbling funny math symbols. But um, <laughs> um, it, it's pretty much just you have to have enough time in order for that to not only get to everybody else, but for them to validate it before the next block comes in. And, you know, it, it might seem kind of silly um, to think about it this way, but this is one of the big reasons we have the block size limit, um, as well as like the, the 10 minute block time interval, because you can construct um, transactions that are very complicated and take a long time for your computer to verify. And you can kind of push up to a, a, the point of a couple minutes um, that it'll take a, a normal desktop computer to verify a block. And so imagine if we had like one minute block times, um, some malicious dickhead could come along and start making a bunch of those complicated transactions that take like two or three minutes to verify. And because a block comes in every minute, roughly, like most people will never catch up to the tip of the blockchain. Like they'll never actually be able to verify it. And so that 10 minutes is there um, because you, you need that long enough period between things to guarantee that people can get it, can verify it and keep up with things. And if something's too fast um, in terms of block intervals, then it's literally going to be impossible um, for anybody to verify the chain or keep in sync with other nodes. Like um like when like Elon um kind of brought up the idea of like make blocks faster, make them bigger on Dogecoin. Um his um suggestion for that literally would have broken the the Dogecoin network. Um it would have been like blocks coming in like every six seconds that were 10 megabytes big potentially most computers couldn't keep up with that. Like mo people would not be able to run a node um, and actually verify anything. And so like that, that interval is super important um, to people being able to do that. And this is a hard concept for new people getting into Bitcoin, perhaps if they're not the most technical to understand here, is that what the Bitcoin network is trying to do is create a decentralized network of value transfer. Um, and we can get into layers. We've discussed Lightning previously, but what we're building here with the Bitcoin uh, baseline uh, blockchain is a settlement layer, uh, one where you have high levels of security, but but you do also uh, have final settlement. And to maintain that decentralization, uh, that this is why the block wars were fought to keep the block size as small as possible, because. Once you go beyond uh, one megabyte blocks, we know that that's going to uh, increase the amount of data that has to propagate, um, and that is going to reduce the number of people who themselves can spin up a node. Mm -hmm. And if people can't do that, then how is this much different than something like PayPal? Exactly. It's by allowing us all to run a node on an old laptop that we can all validate the entire blockchain and that we can all trust that when we receive our Bitcoin, that it is real, and we receive full and final settlement. Uh, this is the settlement layer, as uh, Jack Mallers has been telling me for the last three weeks. Um, but also with that block time propagation, because people talk about it being slow, that exists so that uh, the network has time to fully process each block. And this is what allows us to have a decentralized, fully trusted, highly secure, uh, sorry, fully trustless, highly secure uh, settlement layer. Mm -hmm. And every other, uh, every other magical blockchain which has offered faster or cheaper transactions is making a trade-off against essentially decentralization and security. Yeah, I mean, 
there there is no way to play with something like the block size or block intervals without messing with decentralization. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So let's talk about some of these consensus rules, just so people have an understanding of what they are and why they exist. Um, so specifically, a miner has mined a block. It has to construct those block, uh, those blocks. What are? The, can we give a couple of examples of very simple rules they must follow? Well, um, obviously, as a miner, um, there's going to be the difficulty target that you have to hit hashing a block. So first thing, that has to be correct and valid. Um, there has to be enough leading zeros on the block hash to meet that target or goodbye, like nodes are going to ignore that. Um, also, obviously, um, signature checking. Um, if a miner puts a transaction in a block that doesn't have a valid signature for all the coins being spent, that's invalid. Um, there's also... Let's talk um, about that one because that's important, right? So the block itself is a um, it's essentially a set of transactions. It's uh, adding to the ledger all different transactions that have been cl- included in that block. Um, but if uh, a signature is incorrect, that is somebody attempting to cheat the system, right? To create fake Bitcoin, potentially. Mm-hmm. And 100% of nodes will completely ignore it. Like that, that is one of the most core rules that is applied to validating a block aside from the difficulty itself um, on the actual block header. Well, I was going to say, if a miner tries to cheat the system by putting some fake Bitcoin in there that they're uh, uh, um, re- rewarding themselves to an address they own, the, the nodes will reject it and then they will lose. All, not only will that not get accepted, but the, uh, 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 they will also miss out on their reward of their Coinbase mm-hmm. reward and their transactions. This actually has happened in the past too, um, really quick. Um, the original block reward was 50 Bitcoin. And during the first happening, when that dropped to 25, a bunch of miners actually tried running modified code that just kept the reward as 50 Bitcoin forever. And their blocks were completely ignored by everyone else. Um, they caved and obviously they did not change the block reward to 50 Bitcoin forever. <laughs> Am I right in thinking, though, if they set the block reward to lower, the tr- the, the block will validate? So, for example, it's 6.25 yeah. now, but if they set it to 5, it will validate. But if they try and set it to 7, it won't. Yeah, um, m- miners can do whatever they want with their Coinbase reward. Like, they can claim some of it, not claim all of it. Like, you, you don't have to claim that reward. You just, you just can. can't. You can't create mm-hmm. more. Mm-hmm. But then... um. You know, back to, to rules, though, the, it also gets a lot more complicated and deeper at a technical level. Like, um, you know, uh, really, at the end of the day, a transaction is just a script, like a little program. And like most normal transactions, like the little program just says, um, like, hey, here's a public key, like, check a signature and make sure it came from this public key. But you can do a lot more complicated stuff with that. Um, like, you, you can time lock things so that you cannot spend a coin before a certain block height or before a certain time has been passed. Um, you can make the, um, the hash lock um, like um, primitive that the, the Lightning Network uses for the HTLCs. Um, and so like all, all of these more complicated kind of programs you can make, there are also rules on like how big those can be like size limits, um, how many computations um, a node will run to validate something before it just goes, this is requiring me to compute too much. Um, So like, uh, aside from like all the obvious things, you know, like don't spend um, without a valid signature. Um, Like you, you kind of have a lot more technical things like that that kind of restrict things. And those types of things come back to like, everybody has to be able to afford to validate this. So like, it's not just the block size that's kind of doing that. You also have limitations on how big an individual transaction can be or the script, like in an actual UTXO and things like that. But let's, um, let's talk about how somebody may try and cheat the system um, by operating by creating an invalid block, but also running a node which validates that block. And we're really talking about chain splits here and what happens there. But 
it could be a scenario where a miner creates an invalid block whereby they create a bunch of Bitcoin for themselves uh, and they that could be validated by a node. But if all other nodes reject it, that block only exists on that node and they can keep creating new blocks and keep adding it to that node. But essentially, they've created a new coin at that point because the chain is split. Mm-hmm. And they will make no money unless people want to buy that coin. Exactly. So they can try it on their own, but the only way to create a new coin, which might have value, is actually to have some kind of coordinated split like Bcash. Yes, Bcash keeps losing value uh, relevant to Bitcoin, but at that point there was, uh, let's say, some form of social consensus where people wanted a different coin, which did something different. So they created a new set of rules, they created new nodes, a bunch of people run those nodes, a bunch of miners mined them, and that essentially just split the network in two and created this new coin. And at that point, some of the exchanges were willing to allow that to trade. And then the market, through trading, decided the value of that coin, which is uh, continually dropping compared to Bitcoin. But you can only create, you can only create an, uh, an inv- well, I'm saying an invalid block. You can only create a, a block with different rules by having other nodes which run them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like if, if there is not, some node out there that will accept that block and somebody to buy it then a miner like mining under different rules they're just lighting money on fire essentially so another important part to this is also the exchanges because the exchanges are what give the market price so if somebody was to split the tra- chain and create a new coin then once that coin is traded that that will tell the real value mhm and without that, like there, there is no real way to kind of do that and actually succeed anywhere. Like if the market can't price that, then the miners can't get paid and it can't keep mining. So, an an important point to discuss with this is that people should go and do their history and go and read about the block size wars. There's a very uh, good history of that written by Bitmex, which we'll I'll include in the show mm-hmm. notes. But this was regarding uh, the Segwit two X fork that was discussed uh so uh, this was back in 2017 where there was a group of people who wanted to increase the block size which required new consensus rules um this would have led to a split in the chain some people wanted it to happen some people didn't so there was it was quite obvious that certain miners would mine one chain and some would mine the other but what was really interesting with that is when i can't remember the exchange but one of the exchange allowed people to trade futures on those uh, coins. So you could trade futures prices off this new uh, new coin, which means they could basically set what they're willing to pay for it. And that price dropped heavily compared to the price of Bitcoin, which was a way of people almost voting that they didn't believe in this coin as much. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, um, I think I think a couple exchanges did that, but I'm pretty sure Bitfinex was the first yeah, one I think too. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and so and that kind of led part and part to that was part contributed to the the failure of the fork because people were pricing this coin as less valuable than the original bitcoin Mm -hmm. and yeah i mean you know futures markets like that i think are probably the best tool if things come to that point like if people really do want to split there's no getting around it like that is the simplest cleanest way to kind of gauge the level of support there without opening things up to manipulation. Like, you can't fake putting Bitcoin on the line. With regards to mining, is there anything else we need to discuss? Should we discuss orphan blocks, what they are and what that means? Oh, yeah, I think we could do that now. Um, So, you know, obviously a miner mines a block, they spit it out to the whole rest of the network, and they, you know, the network verifies it, and then all the miners out there who've gotten that stop mining what they're mining and start mining a new block on top of that. Well, there's always the potential because when a miner finds a block, it's completely random that two miners find a block at the same time. And when that happens, they're both going to send it out to the network and some part of the network is going to get one block first. The other part of the network is going to get the other one first. And until the next block comes in, um, you know, there there isn't really a, a tip of the chain. Like there isn't consensus on like what the current balance is until some miner 
finds the next block on top of one of those two. And then that decides which one of those conflicting blocks sticks around. And then the other one doesn't make it into the blockchain. That miner earns no money for that. And it's almost like that block would, it never existed, essentially. And, you know, this, this kind of just happens as a, a matter of course, um, sometimes, you know, it's blocks come in when they come in, sometimes that happens. But, you know, it, it's really just that simple in general, although that, that probably will come up as a potential issue um, with a, a few ways that you can do soft forks. Right. So if there is an orphan block, uh, the miner that created the block that uh, became orphaned off no longer receives their block reward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it just, it, it disappears essentially from the blockchain like it never happened. And is this why we have this 100 block wait for them to be able to spend their Coinbase rewards? Exactly. Because there, there is always the potential something gets orphaned, you know, a reorg happens, blah, blah, blah. And so that's specifically so miners can't play games and, and try to, you know, con people and then, oh, that block disappeared. That wasn't real money. So we should probably talk about confirmations here so people understand what that means. So if you're using certain software or certain exchanges, when you send Bitcoin um, out and um, they will make, they will wait till they've received a certain number of confirmations till they allow you to spend it. But that really, those confirmations are the number of blocks that have been built on top of the network. Now, the reason they do that is, and the reason most go, I think the kind of general consensus is six, although I know some use three, and there are some people who are like crazy people who use one, but the reason they do that is because a reorganization of the blocks six blocks deep is very unlikely, whereas, you know, like a one block reorganization, it, it, it's still unlikely can happen. Mm -hmm, exactly. You know, th this is kind of a core part of mining. Um, it's all based on probability. So really speaking, like the tip of the chain, like the, the most recent block that just came in right now, in all likelihood, 99% of the time, that is the block. You know, look at that block. You'll know what everyone's Bitcoin balance is. But then an orphan happens. And then, oh, the guy who just sent you money, um, you know, sends it back to himself. And you never get paid because you just assume that first block was good enough. And so especially with large amounts of money, especially like that, that's the convention for waiting for those extra blocks built on top, because every block that comes on top of the one before it, it makes it exponentially harder and more expensive to kind of go back and undo things. So once you have those couple of extra blocks on top, um, yeah, you, you don't have anything to worry about unless the entire Bitcoin network has something to worry about. Yeah, and a good example of that is the company BitRefill. I can't remember if they use zero or one confirmation, but they might actually use zero confirmations. But most people, when they're buying something from BitRefill, it's $5, 10 $20. It's, you know, it's usually a pretty low number. And they've done the calculation that the number of times uh, this will happen is very, very unlikely. Therefore, they can swallow the cost for the very rare times where they've accepted zero block confirmations. But if you were sending, you know, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, you're going to want to wait, you know, six, maybe even even higher number of blocks for confirmation. Yeah, like my my business, um, we do not accept zero comp for anything. Like until there is at least one confirmation on something. Um, nothing is getting shipped anywhere. Now, like, obviously, it's, it's your own choice. You know, if BitRefill did the math and that's an acceptable margin for them, it's their choice to make. But yeah, definitely, it is wildly different to, say, be fine with zero comp for like $20. But um, yeah, don't play games like that when you're talking thousands of dollars or something. Okay, so we have the rules of consensus, but we also have this kind of social consensus uh, that builds around upgrades to the system. Can we talk about how upgrades happen, the process? This is an interesting topic that I think is going to be very counterintuitive um, to a lot of people. Taproot is actually two things. It is the Snore signatures, um, 
that is upgrading standard SegWit stuff. And then it's masked, uh, Merkleized abstract syntax tree. So that's, that's the cool thing where you can bury all the different spending conditions and only show the one that you're using. But both of those things have been discussed amongst developers since literally 2013. Like if you go on bitcointalk.org, um, you know, you'll find people like Peter Todd, like Adam Back, um, e even Mike Hearn, um, the evil enemy of Bitcoin that he was, discussing things like Schnorr signatures and how much that could optimize things. Um, the Merkleized abstract syntax tree that lets fun stuff happen. So people might look around right now and go, yay, Taproot, cool new thing. But both of those are literally two ideas put together that are eight years old or more, uh, as far as ideas developers have talked about. And like, I, I cannot stress this enough. When you're trying to gauge consensus for an upgrade proposal, it is not a democracy. Absolutely not. It is not voting. It is not majority wins. That is not how things are done. And the whole, the whole way um, and process for kind of gauging these things is rough consensus. And this is actually something that comes from the Internet Engineering Task Force, one, one of the big bodies that actually um, standardizes all the, the protocols and, and stuff for the Internet. And pretty much the idea is, like, I propose an idea. And now anybody can bring criticism to that idea anybody. Now we debate this idea. We, we go through all of the criticism <clears throat> and pretty much the only kind of restriction here is any criticism is valid as long as it's not just total trolling. Like if you are actually making a reasoned argument, you have a reason to criticize something. You're not just concerned trolling or wasting time that has to be addressed. Like you are not allowed to receive criticism in, in this kind of process and not address it, not answer the, the problems that that criticism brings up. And so the general idea is something is considered to have consensus or rough consensus if the idea was proposed, um, it was criticized and discussed thoroughly, and all of the reasonable criticism was addressed with answers or solutions or a reason why that's not the problem somebody thought it was. And as long as all of that criticism was addressed rationally, that idea has consensus. However, if there's, if there's still the like outstanding criticism that has not been addressed, like reasonable, legitimate criticism, then that idea does not have consensus. So let's talk about an example. Let's use SegWit as the example. SegWit was a proposed upgrade to the Bitcoin network, which would help uh, support and enable lightning payments, but also would uh, increase the block weight of, uh, of, of the blocks. Talk about that as a process. Somebody proposed the idea, uh, it was discussed as an idea, and consensus was eventually achieved. Um, you mentioned that uh, as long as there isn't any outstanding criticism, but what is valid outstanding Reasonable, criticism? reasonable criticism. How is that j judged? Or is it because we live in a decentralized way, it really just comes down to a general kind of feeling? Like, how does that work? It's, it's just rationality. I mean, like, you know, part of, a big part of the reason for SegWit was the not just the Lightning Network, but also anything like it that had the same kind of requirements. Because um, you, you have this issue, transaction malleability. And before SegWit, like I could make a Bitcoin transaction, I could sign it, but I could play games with it. So like, let's say I sign this transaction and then you... Um, you take an output in that that I'm giving to you and you sign another transaction based off of that. I could um, like play with the signature, but it would still be valid and it would change that transaction ID. And because your transaction and every transaction in Bitcoin has to point to the last one 
um, in kind of the chain of transactions where the coins that it's spending came from. Um, I changed that transaction ID. So that transaction that you made spending off of that one is invalid now because the transaction ID is different because I played this game with it. The, the whole core idea behind SegWit was to handle um, the transaction differently so that it's not part of that transaction ID. So that if I go play games with that, it does not change the ID of the transaction that I'm playing with, and it does not invalidate anything built on top of that. And now, you know, there, there is a lot of um, just fun and nonsense around that. Um, like, you know, there's still a signature there. It's just put together differently in terms of data. And like one of the air quote criticisms of um, SegWit was that removing the signature would let anybody spend anybody's coins without signatures. And there, there is a little kernel of truth there, but it's mostly complete horseshit. And the kernel of truth is that when you add a new feature like that in a soft fork, um, the way that that works is there are essentially kind of op codes or, or you know, program pieces in the um, Bitcoin script that are not defined. They don't do anything right now. And when we add a new feature, we kind of define those and then deploy it. But the people who haven't upgraded yet, they don't have that new definition. So they don't know what's going on there. They just trust anything that uses it no matter what. And so now, if most nodes if most miners, if almost nobody actually upgraded to SegWit and then somebody created a SegWit UTXO, yeah, anybody could steal that coin without the keys. But that goes for literally any soft fork, including past soft forks that went just fine. So, you know, you, you look at SegWit and it was, it was obviously kind of contentious. Um, but at the end of the day, all the arguments against it were things like that. Like, that's not a rational argument. Like, you're kind of distorting the truth here to try to argue against SegWit. And so in rough consensus, but it's like you just ignore that because it's it's not a, an honest, rational argument. But but what I'm saying is there's no objective way of measuring whether consensus has been achieved. Uh, I guess the... The idea gets pitched and it gets tested, it gets challenged. And even if there is people who oppose it, quite vocal opposition, if enough people feel that the the criticism has been answered and it's worth doing, people will just start working on developing it, whether or not there is that outlier who might not like it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so they can work on it as much as they want. They can commit the code Let's talk about acceptance of the code. How do we actually get to that point where it is accepted? Well, um, people have to start running it. But um, yeah, I, th I think we're kind of getting towards the point of how do we coordinate all this stuff. Mm. <laughs> yeah. How, how is this all coordinated? You know, like, like I said at the start of the show, you have a soft fork and a hard fork. Um, you know, a soft fork will restrict the rules more than they are now, and a hard fork will expand them. Um, now, I, I think we should start with soft forks. That's the super majority of the upgrades Bitcoins have done. Um, some okay, people would argue... We, let's preempt that. Sorry. So just to make it clear, there are soft forks and hard forks. Just differentiate the two so people understand why why they are different. Well, it's it's the whether you're restricting the rules or expanding them more, like whether you're not allowing something that used to be allowed or whether you're going to allow something that was previously not allowed. But the important difference being is that a hard fork, in, uh, sorry, a soft fork is backwards compatible mm -hmm. and a hard fork isn't. Correct, Mundo. Okay, and... Uh, <laughs> Am I right in thinking we've never had a hard fork in Bitcoin? I can't remember. That is actually a hotly debated thing. Um, there are, I think, two instances where some developers um, 
call things a hard fork. Um, I personally do not think that the things labeled hard forks were, um, you know, and I mean, that that's a whole can of worms. Okay. Um, we, we do that I, another I time. No. <laughs> but, 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 but certainly we haven't had a hard fork uh, for a long time. And w let's explain just very quickly why a hard fork is so challenging. Everybody has to upgrade at once or you de facto get two new coins. Um, like there is no backwards compatibility. There is no grace period. Um, if you hard fork, this is the hard fork. When that point is reached, anybody who's upgraded forks off. Anybody who doesn't stays where they are. It is 100% guaranteed that that chain will split into two. And now whether it stays that way or not, that's up for debate, but it will split. It will, and it will split because, uh, will it split even if uh, all miners upgrade? But say some nodes don't. Yeah. Um, every node that doesn't upgrade will stop receiving blocks. Um, that blockchain will stop growing and those nodes will just sit there forever waiting for a block that will never come. So in some ways, it's more important at that point that all miners upgrade. Uh, it's up to the nodes themselves because if they want to have a dead chain, that's that's up to them. But if uh, if if a miner doesn't upgrade... Uh, there's because what I'm kind of thinking is that it's probably easier to coordinate all miners to upgrade than it is nodes because there are lots of people out there who are probably running nodes who might not keep an eye on everything on day to day. Whereas, no, yeah, you, the miners you have all... to have everybody upgrade at once, like yeah. just doing miners doesn't solve anything because you're you're talking businesses the economy like anybody who doesn't upgrade their whole business breaks like everything what, falls yeah, apart what i'm what i'm saying is then whilst you might get consensus from all miners to upgrade and you might have consensus you know the majority of nodes to upgrade there's going to be a few outliers who just haven't got around to it yet who maybe haven't upgraded their software um well i mean that's irrelevant if they're not using it you know what I mean? Like if, if you're running a node and you're not using it for anything, then it, it might as well not exist. Well, for example, now I'm away for five weeks. If the upgrade happened, but I didn't upgrade my node, I would have a static dead node with no new blocks being generated. I can always upgrade it when I get back and catch up. But I it feels to me the real danger is, well, there's two dangers. There's dangers if miners split and they start mining separate chains. That's a problem. Or if miners want to upgrade, but the majority of nodes don't. Well, I mean, that comes down to what are they going to do in the market? Um, if all the miners upgrade to a hard fork and none of the businesses, none of the users do, um, nobody wants to buy that new fork coin probably. So those miners aren't going to make any money. And if they're rational economically, they're going to turn off the hard fork and they're going to go back to mining what people actually want to buy. Well, so this is what happened with UASF. So again, I've said to people they should go and look into the block size wars. Specifically, they should go and look into UASF because at that point, uh, the miners, a lot of miners, were signaling to do the upgrade, the S2X upgrade, to upgrade to two megabyte blocks. Um, but that was economically driven. Uh, the users themselves, uh, led by um, a, a shadowy underground Bitcoin guy, uh, and uh, led by no one except well, themselves. Led by themselves, <laughs> but so, you know the UASF uh, upgrade to uh, the movement for the nodes was that if the users don't support this, then this is bad for miners. So, so that was a big support for well, uh, maintaining the one megabyte block size. But I'm, what I'm let, saying let's, is... Let's I'll, shift to, to softworks because yeah. that's really what a lot of 148 and everything was about. But, um, you know, like, like you said earlier, they're backwards compatible. So this mm -hmm. guaranteed things are going to split in half dynamic with a hard fork, that, that is not a guarantee for a softwork. Now, it's still possible, but it's not guaranteed the way that a hard fork is. And the, the reason that most upgrades in Bitcoin's history have been done this way is specifically because of that. Like if you take currently almost or no, less than because of Elon, um, less than a trillion dollar market cap, 
um, you know, monetary network and you split that in half, like you're, you're screwing with a massive market. Like that will have economic consequences that will cost businesses money. It will probably result in a devaluation in the market. That, that is not something you want to do with a big valuable network. So we do soft forks. And there's actually a couple of different ways that these have been done historically. Um, kind of the, the earliest and the simplest way is just a flag day. Um, and this is almost all of the soft forks that, or actually I think all of the soft forks that Satoshi deployed before he disappeared were done with flag days like this. It's literally just you put a line of code in there at this block height or at this day and time just start enforcing this new rule. And it's very simple, it's very easy, but the problem is um, you don't really know who has upgraded or not in that, that situation. Like just having that turn on for anybody that upgraded, that doesn't tell you how many miners upgraded, um, how many exchanges and businesses upgraded, how many users upgraded. And so, this is kind of where that risk of a chain split happens. You know, like I said earlier with the um, kind of anybody can spend your coin segwit stuff. Um, that is true for any new feature um, that isn't being enforced by most of the economy and most of the miners. So, you know, you do something like a flag day, you know, just, you know, tomorrow it's turned on. And then a bunch of miners didn't upgrade, a bunch of businesses didn't upgrade. Well, some a-hole can come along and steal somebody's SegWit coins, so to say. And then those miners who haven't upgraded, they'll just accept that because they didn't upgrade. They're not validating it. They'll mine that block that just stole somebody's SegWit coins against the rules. And all the miners that haven't upgraded, they'll keep building on that block. And so you will have a chain split here between people who actually upgraded and started enforcing SegWit and those who didn't. And so, you know, that is kind of why BIP9 was created. Um, and it's pretty much a deployment mechanism where... Um, in a section of the block, um, there's kind of little bits, um, like ones and zeros that are supposed to tell you like the version of a block, like what version of the Bitcoin protocol is this enforcing, is this made with? And the entire idea behind BIP9 was we could deploy a client that's going to turn a new feature on, but only if miners flip that bit and if enough of the miners have. So kind of the idea here was, um, you know, this is not voting on whether to turn anything on whatsoever, but it's just a way to kind of gauge how many miners at least claim they've upgraded. And once a majority of miners have signaled that and claimed that they upgraded, then the feature will turn on and everybody's nodes who've upgraded will start enforcing it. And kind of the whole idea was just to, to be able to gauge and figure out when most people have upgraded so that you don't have that chain split happen because a lot of people didn't. And some guy made the transaction that broke the rules because he knows it's going to split the blockchain in half. So, so let's talk about minor signaling. How do they signal that they are going to uh, activate the upgrade and what kind of percentage are we looking for of minor signaling for us to say, okay, it's ready to switch on? Well, they literally just flip a piece of data in the block. Um, actually, most uh, mining pool software that I'm aware of literally has custom features, so they can just do that at the snap of a button. Um, but um, pretty much the percentage is kind of an open question. Um, historically, it was deployed um, every time up to SegWit with a 95% requirement. You know, they wanted a super majority of all miners um, upgraded and signaling before turning something on. But 
the most recent um, core deployment with speedy trial for Taproot um, only required 90%. And so like, honestly, um, that, that is something you, you can kind of play with. Like there, there is no hard requirement there, except that it be more than um, half of the miners. Like you have to have at least a clear majority so that if none of them are lying, um, they would orphan um, a block for anybody breaking the new rule so that even people who have upgraded like aren't going to get cheated or follow some blockchain they don't want to be. And, and so I noticed on Twitter with Taproot, with people tracking minor activation, they were still after 95% of minor signaled. That was when people started to kind of like leap around and celebrate and say, okay, I think we're ready to go. Um, if Once we've reached that point, how do... Is it then uh, like agreed that at this specific time people will activate the upgrade? Um, yeah, if if this locks in um, in the next difficulty period with 90 plus percent miners signaling, um, that will lock in. Everybody who is upgraded um, to the newest Bitcoin core or the UASF client out there, Taproot will be guaranteed um, to activate. And that will start being enforced um, in November. And kind of the reason um, for that long delay here from now till November is, you know, like I said, mining pools, they, their software is set up so they can signal for upgrades um, just like that and not actually have to upgrade to the new client. So I think kind of the logic here for the, the long window before Taproot actually turns on is to just let miners signal and lock it in, but then have this long period before it's enforced so that miners can actually upgrade to the new client that enforces Taproot um, if they haven't already. Okay, cool. So that kind of that kind of makes sense. Okay, right. So one of the things that seems to be very cool about this, um, which does... Uh, run in opposition to some of the critics of Bitcoin, which I always see as people who, who are either massive shitcoiners or or new to Bitcoin, is that they they call it they they claim that Bitcoin is old tech, boomer tech. You know, uh, uh, it's being out competed by other technology which moves faster. But this is one of the things I love about Bitcoin. You know, I'm holding all my well, let's say majority of my wealth in Bitcoin. I don't want it to be easy to change. Like I want it to be hard to change. I only want changes to come that are absolutely necessary and absolutely benefit the network. Um, and this, I see this being hard to change as a feature. You know, and for anybody listening, you know, this, there, there's this idea that eventually Bitcoin will ossify and it, it won't be changeable anymore. Um, and I think a lot of the, the reason, at least my thinking behind um, why I think that will eventually come to be um, is, is pretty much like think about the rough consensus and like how we actually gauge consensus for the thing itself before we try to activate it. Think about how hard that's going to get the bigger Bitcoin gets. And I think if if that doesn't play out that way, if Bitcoin doesn't ossify, then that's very dangerous. Like if Bitcoin just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it does not get harder to change the bigger it gets, that's kind of a dangerous situation to be in. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. I mean, we, we have this taproot change coming. Is there, with these soft forks, I mean, by the time it is activated, has it been so well tested that some kind of catastrophic bug is unlikely? Or will there be a period, say, after the activation of Taproot where someone like yourself will be like, mm, I'm just not going to just move some coins for a bit. I just want to see see how this works. Well, I mean, there is always the potential for bugs, always. But, you know, the developer community is getting bigger. Um, this code has been going through review for over a year now. And like I said, the underlying concepts ha have been, you know, being bounced around by devs since like 2013. Right. Okay. Okay. But still, okay. I mean, it's, it's there's just no there's there is no rush whatsoever when a new feature is is activated to just go rush and use it immediately. 
like unless you want to do something um, that you need that new feature for, like don't feel any rush to do that. You know what I mean? It, it's not the end of the world. Like when SegWit activated, I didn't start moving UTXOs um, to SegWit addresses for months afterwards. Like it, it's it's not a big rush. So let, let it bed in, let it be tested, get a feel for it. Yada yada. So with Taproot, are we getting new Taproot addresses? Yeah, we we are getting um, a new address format. Hopefully, this should be the last time this happens. But um, uh, the whole reason for the BEC32 addresses that Segwit uses um, was kind of to make it harder to um, like screw up manually copying an address somewhere. And there there was a little goof up um by peter woola in implementing that and um when when this first came out he he was like kicking himself over the head and like oh i can't believe i i feel like he like way over blew how big the issue is in terms of like apologizing it but um taproot is going to come with a, a modified version of back 32 to fix that and after that, um, we should never need to add a new address format ever again. Like everything after Taproot can just keep using that. Okay, that's fair. Are we ready to talk about Taproot? You got to do BIP8, man. Got to do, right, do BIP8. Eight. Explain, well, you should explain what a BIP is, firstly, just because people go, what, what, what do you mean BIP8? A Bitcoin improvement proposal. Um, the, these are pretty much the documents that people write up um, in order to propose a change to Bitcoin. Um, also kind of just document things um, that might not be well understood or documented. But um, BIP9 and BIP8 are the two proposals for activating soft forks and different ways to do that. Now, the thing with BIP9 um, and the minor signaling is it can fail. Like the whole design for BIP9 is if the whatever threshold you set for miners to activate a new feature, if that isn't met in the activation window, then that feature will just completely fail to activate. So it kind of leaves the door open for miners to disrupt something or stop something from activating, even if the entire rest of the network, you know, has consensus and wants this thing. So the idea behind BIP8. Um, at least originally, was you pretty much do something just like BIP9, where miners can signal and it will activate based on miner signaling. But instead of kind of failing to activate at the end of that window, um, if miners haven't signaled enough to activate the feature at the end of the window, it'll just activate anyway. Um, so miners cannot play games or stop users who upgraded from enforcing that feature. Like all they can do is turn it on early. And if they don't turn it on early, it's going to turn on at the end of that activation period anyway. Um, and kind of, um, yeah, I, I feel like I should save most of my thoughts on this for that, that show um, in Miami. You know, it's, I, I want to keep this less about my opinion and just the facts here. But that's the core difference between the two of them. Like BIP9, if miners do not signal, then whatever feature is being activated, it will just fail to activate. But with BIP8, it will turn on at the end no matter what miners do. I think knowing how complex Taproot is, and, and it's mainly a lot of stuff in the background that unlocks a number of features for the techies. I don't think we know, need to go into a huge amount of detail. I did cover this with Andrew Polstra. I'll add it in the show notes. People can go check it out. Just do the shortened version of, short version of why Taproot is important. Well, first off, um, Schnorr signatures allow us to do multi-sig way more efficiently so that instead of having however many signatures there are keys in a multi-sig, you just have one. That is a huge privacy win and a huge cost effectiveness win. And then there's the mast aspect, or aspect of it, the Merkleized abstract syntax tree. That is awesome because let's say I want to lock my coins up, but make sure that you can spend them if I die. Um, right now, I just have to make a massive UTXO that has that whole script 
in the UTXO. Like I can spend it with my key or Peter can spend it with his key if I haven't moved this in six months because I'm probably dead. And both of those things will be visible on chain. Both of those things will, will be there no matter which way it gets spent and I have to pay fees for it. Taproot lets me do crypto magic and bury that, you know, you can spend it if I haven't moved it in six months out of that script. So all you see on chain is just my key can spend those coins. And then I give you the information that would let you spend it, like the little taproot tree that commits to that. And nobody will ever know that you can also spend my coins unless you actually spend them. Like that is just completely hidden from the world unless you use it to actually move those coins. Okay, that's a good, simple explanation. Okay, so this is a massive upgrade though. It, do you think this is going to be the last big upgrade or is there something that people are thinking about starting work on afterwards? Because I know this is something that's been in the works for years. Um, last big upgrade or what do we go do next? I hope not because... If it is, then Bitcoin is going to be a lot more crippled and less flexible than a lot of us hope. Um, Why is that? I mean, it's just, well, for one, um, Lightning. It does not scale properly without the next feature that people want, um, any pre out. So you, you know how um, I said earlier, when you spend a, a UTXO in a transaction, you actually have to like point to the previous transaction that created that UTXO by transaction ID, any prev out would allow you to, instead of pointing at a specific transaction, um, you just point at a script. So like this public key and an amount. And you can spend any transaction, regardless of what the transaction ID is, um, as long as it is that key and that amount. And so this lets you kind of streamline the Lightning Network heavily. Like right now, every pre-signed transaction you make for every update to your channel you do, you have to keep all of that. With any prevout, um, you would only have to keep the most recent one because the, the little magic of it is, um, you know, you can take a signature that spent um, a coin that has that script and that amount, and you can make any other transaction, um, you know, that has that same script, that same amount, do anything else with that. So like, like I have a transaction hitting chain that's using any prev out. Um, it's old, like it's not giving the lightning participants the right amount of money. Um, instead of penalizing them, what I would do is I would take the signature from that transaction and then I would take my most recent transaction and attach that signature to it. And I could actually spend the out of date one that just hit chain with my most recent one. But you can only um, do that for a transaction that came after. Like there, there's a little sequence number in the transaction that gets incremented up by one every time you update. So when I use the most recent one, there is no higher transaction. So I know I'm going to get my money. So like all, all I have to do is keep that one single transaction or piece of data instead of a piece of data for every single time my lightning channel is updated. So without that, like lightning is way less scalable and flexible. But that is the next big feature I think most devs are concentrating on. And I really, really hope Taproot is not the last upgrade because if we don't get that, then um, Lightning will still be very useful, but it will be a lot less useful than it would be with that. Well, I, I don't. I, I, it sounds like we will definitely get more upgrades then if that's super important. And I've been using the Lightning Network over in El Salvador, uh, I used it a number of times and uh, loved the fact that I could make quick and cheap payments. And I was actually buying coffee with it, which was quite funny. Cool. All right. So I think we've covered it. Is there anything we've not covered here that you still want to cover? Because we've covered quite a bit. Yeah, I guess we could talk a little bit about 
the dangers of forks in terms of malicious ones. Um, you know, like a big benefit of soft forks is that they're backwards compatible. But that can also become a very bad thing. Like, let's say 70% of the miners um, decide they're going to censor you, Peter. Like, they're never going to mine one of Peter's Bitcoin transactions ever again, and they're going to orphan any block that does. Well, there's nothing you can do about that. Like, th those miners have decided that they are going to do a soft fork that only they are enforcing, that Peter's coins can never be mined again. And it does not matter at all that no user, no business, like nobody else is enforcing that because they make all the blocks. So even though like nobody's running this new feature that Peter can't transact, like no other user or economic entity is enforcing that because all the miners are, well, that's, it's enforced. It doesn't matter that your node isn't enforcing that. The miners are forcing that stricter rule on you, and there's nothing you can do about it. So, like, soft forks are very useful in terms of the backwards compatibility, upgrading things without being um, disruptive to the network. But miners can enforce malicious forks that users would not want and there's not really much we could do about it in a lot of the situations. Right, okay. Something definitely to be aware of. Okay, before we finish, can we please talk about the Mining Council? Because I do just want to pick your brain, bring up any relevant historical context, because there seems to be split views on this. Um, I naturally, well, I just think Elon Musk is a fucking clown right now. Um, and the reason yep. I think he's a clown is um, he two reasons. Firstly, he has access to anyone. I'm sure if he put out there and said, look, I, I would like some advice, I want some help on Bitcoin, anybody would come forward and help him. And I feel like if he sat down with somebody like Adam Back, etc., he would be able to learn a lot very quickly about uh, Bitcoin. But he's choosing to lose in, uh, learn in public, something I've done myself which is a brutal experience as well. Uh, you know as much as I do how much early time I spent putting ideas out there that were stupid and wrong and got heavily shit on for it. And I'm grateful for it in, in retrospect. Because you were actually learning in public, though. Elon, yeah. I think, has got a lot of shady shit going on. Well, there is that as well. But, but uh, it, it was a healthy experience for me, but I pissed a lot of people off in the process. But that's fine. It's just, you know, it's one of those experiences you go through. You discover Bitcoin, you think something doesn't make sense, you put it out publicly, you get criticized, you go and research and you refine your ideas. That's, that's how I, I've done it. Uh, but I've tried to be honest about doing that. I feel like he is part learning in public, but also I don't 100% obviously trust him. I, I, I think... Uh, it's all carbon credits. This is yeah, all about I, carbon credits. I 100% guarantee you he wants a Bitcoin mining carbon credit market. Like yeah. that's where Tesla makes all its money. If it weren't for yeah. carbon credits, that company would be making no money. And I suspect you're right. Um, so be it. If that's his game, so be it. I, it's, I don't think it's particularly healthy. Uh, uh, what really pisses me off is we seem to get two tweets at a time from him. It will be a Bitcoin tweet and then it will be a Doge tweet. And the Doge tweets are very, you know, he's just basically bullish on Doge. Whether he means it or not is a different story, but he is leading lemmings off the cliff who will get wrecked, as we know. Because I'll tell you this. If, if Tesla goes private in the near future, then Elon just pump and dump the shitcoin on a bunch of morons so that he could take his company private. Potentially. Potentially. Whatever he is up to, so be it. Um, but I've seen a mixture of responses. So I'm, I'm just trolling the fuck out of him because I, I just think he's a bit of a dick um, uh, for some of the ways he's behaved and the influence he's exerting. Um, I have seen a couple of people say, look, uh, fossil fuels, fuels are an issue. And I, I think that's debatable. I, th I know some people don't think they are. I mean, I think they are, but I also think the free market is important. But other people saying, look, 
it's just a group of people who've got together to agree to uh, publish their uh, uh, energy mix, which a lot of companies do bullshit. anyway. I call total bullshit. If that was true, then when asked about carbon credits, um, I forget his name, one of the participants in this would not have said, I can't comment on that on behalf of the council. He would have said no. That answer means that came up in that conversation. Like this, I'm sorry, like maybe maybe I'm just an asshole. I give zero benefit of the doubt here. This is arrogant people who think that everything can be solved with a, a call to some corporate boardroom stepping up and LARPing about we're going to fix Bitcoin. That is what this is. It is nothing else. It's going to be the same shit over again. Yeah, p- potentially. Like I say, th- there is though a mix of responses. Um, w- the question I really want to ask you is, as somebody who's lived through a lot of the history of Bitcoin, um, there will be people listening. I know there will because I've seen the replies. So when people are trolling Elon, uh, whether it's I or uh, other people, there's a lot of people jumping in and saying, leaving the fuck alone, shut the fuck up, Elon's good for Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. Um, at the same time, I've also seen Michael Saylor get heavily criticized for the first time. Now, I, I, I like Michael and I think his intentions are uh, honest, but I also at the same time am aware he's a large Bitcoin holder. By the by, whatever, whatever. What is the historical context regarding uh, meetings such as this, associations such as this? Why is it that we should be fearful? What is at risk here? normalizing the idea that a bunch of corporate CEOs dictate how Bitcoin works or how to handle Bitcoin's problems or like, like I I do not like Michael Saylor. He said the right things. He preaches to the maxis on Twitter. I don't care because none of that changes at the end of the day that he is the CEO of a regulated company that will kiss regulatory ass anywhere necessary to protect his investment. Like he is not here for the same reasons that most of the people I know in this space are here. He will not put up the fight that most of the people I know in this space will. End of story. He's a CEO of a public company. He he can't play those games. And like the, the danger here is like people in this space, the actual experts, the actual people who have been here, the actual people who know what is going on need to stop, excuse my language, greeting every famous rich person who walks into the room with a free hand job. Because all this is doing is creating this impression to the larger general public that people like that have any clue what they're talking about. They don't. Like, go on Michael Saylor's page um, or his Twitter page and look up the the video he posted, the seven network effects of Bitcoin. He's just regurgitating shit Trace Mayer said for years. Like that whole multi-layered net, that's Trace Mayer. Like he he's just repeating what Trace Mayer said. I'm holding judgment back for the moment from, from Michael Saylor because like I say, I've been, I have been impressed with his uh, fast understanding of Bitcoin and his staunch defense of it very publicly. Um, but what, what is the actual risk here? What is it that Bitcoiners are worried about could happen from this? Well, this is going to create a regulatory body that can be captured by the government. Um, they're already talking about pressuring um, miners based on different energy sources. Um, that That's what this disclosure will amount to publicly. So think about how that goes. Maybe miners who aren't green enough get taxed more or don't get approved for opening up an operation. Like I said, carbon credits. Well, why are you refusing to comment on carbon credits on behalf of the council? Because some members of the council probably want that. And like ultimately, th- this is just how regulatory creep happens. Not to mention the fact that one of the mining pools involved with this are the jokers memeing about being OFAC compliant. And, you know, uh, we're just going to censor transactions that the government tells us to. Like, like it's this simple. Shit does not happen in a two week news cycle. And too many Bitcoiners are focused like zombies watching the mainstream media on this two week news cycle. And when it ends, they completely forget what happened in the last one and move on to the next one. And people don't pay attention to the longer term directions and trends of things. 
because, oh, everything didn't explode in this news cycle. So it's not a problem on to the next one. I just forgot what happened in the last two weeks. Like that is how apathy happens. That is how, you know, people get away with shit right in front of our eyes because everybody just pretends like if something doesn't explode in this week, it's not a problem. So it's something potentially slippery, slippery and shady in the backgrounds, a slippery slope to potential regulatory capture uh, of a bunch of people who feel influential or who are poten- potentially influential, changing both the narrative and, and f- forcing things which aren't in the best interest of Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, like they're the miners. Like you can't get more integral to the functioning of Bitcoin than the miners. So what is it? What is the role of Bitcoin as at the moment, if you care about this, what do you think people should be doing? If you're a Twitter troll, call people the fuck out and don't let them get away with it. If you're a developer, start diving through things like Betterhash, Stratum V2, um, P2 Pool. Start looking at actual technology that can help decentralize mining more. Like if you're a business guy, I don't know, look, see if you can find some way to make money pushing things in that direction. But it's just like do something. Because sitting around and making excuses for people who keep nudging things in that direction, it's not going to end well. Okay, so it's pretty big stuff. Mm -hmm. So we should call them the fuck out, not accept any of this, troll them, question them, pressure them. What are we trying to get them to do? Are we expecting the uh, uh, mining council to be disbanded? Or are we expecting them to publicly discuss their plans? What, what, what do you think should be happening here? Get rid of it, from my opinion. Although we both know that's probably not going to happen. So if you're not going to get rid of it, yeah. Um, you you want to do something like this? Open up. Give us transparency. Don't give us this horseshit closed door meeting and then have one member of the meeting just, oh, I can't comment on that issue that totally came up um, for everybody, um, but I won't acknowledge it came up. Like, like, get the fuck out of here. Like, imagine mining in North America where you have to deal with carbon credit bullshit. Like, Im- imagine that. that. You just completely set up regulatory capture. I'm going to see if I can get anyone on to discuss it then. I think we should put all the questions to them publicly. And I'd be interesting to see if they would actually do it. I do think perhaps I pissed them all off or pissed some of them off by just flat out calling bullshit on it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's an interesting one because there are people I like and trust who, like Nick Carter, I, you know, I like Nick a lot. I trust him. Uh, I trust him a lot. I think he's a good Bitcoiner. He supports Bitcoin. He was uh, he was quite dismissive of how influential this could be. Uh, I, is that a, is that the slippery slope? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you know, and just to say too, like I, I respect Nick a lot. Um, yeah, I think Nick's he gets great. shit for a lot of idiotic reasons, but I do fundamentally disagree with him on this. Well, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, I'm going to talk to him about it as well because I I'd, I'd like to see what his uh, thoughts are on it. I, I think Nick is fucking great and we're ble- blessed to have him. He's one of the best writers on Bitcoin as well. Interesting times, Shinobi. It's funny. Um, four years in Bitcoin is a long time and and you certainly become a different person uh, the longer you stay and the more skin in the game you have. Um, you care a lot more about protecting the network, uh, reducing influence and um, calling bullshit out. Uh it's a it's a really <clears throat> it's a really interesting thing sometimes because uh, sometimes I'm like oh you should shut your mouth Pete um, you might piss sponsors off you might piss potential guests off but I don't know man I feel like I feel like there's bigger issues at hand now and you have to call this shit out and go and take all the flack with it yeah I mean you know I can't knock needing to make a living Pete but this is why I have never done the sponsor thing with any content I make. Like, I'm going to call shit how I see it, and I'm not putting some financial incentive between that. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. All right, man. Well, listen, awesome episode. We've done 90 minutes, which is incredible. Um, 
I'm looking forward to getting this out there and seeing the feedback. And uh, do you know what we're going to do next month? Have you thought ahead? Um, actually, still unknown who the developer was. I think that might be interesting if it's someone I have gotten into shit with in the past. But I I feel like the next one, um, we, we should um, bring that uh, core dev who wanted to come on and discuss kind of the larger internet infrastructure in terms of mining and the network attacks and stuff. Let's do that, man. All right, cool. Well, listen, I'm going to see you in uh, just over a week. Looking forward to hanging out in person and uh, perhaps we'll record a a show in person while I'm in Miami. Sounds good. All right, dude, I will see you in a week. Mm Mm-hmm.